host, Eric. We're here on Talk With Fans. People talking about unrequited love today. What drives oh, you crazy? Oh. Some people say what drives them crazy is loving people who don't love me. That drives them crazy. <laughs> now, the question I have regarding that is how many people in this room have experienced that? I have, or I've been at least smitten with somebody who didn't return the attention. It's, it's easier. All right, let's go down the line. Let's go in order, okay? Um, if you have a mic, uh, say it. And if you don't want to use the mic and you want to type, then just go ahead and type. Kukifsa, are you there? Do you have any, you want to talk about any experiences you have with unrequited love? Uh, sure. I have been on both ends, and I would say I'm currently on both ends, in which um, some girl that I have deemed not for me is insisting she is, and some girl I like has not... Uh, She's like, hell no, Kukufsa. I told you I don't like that name. Kukufsa is too hard to say. Yeah. Is that what she said Pretty to much. you? Hmm. That wasn't it. Um, okay, which is worse? Not getting what you want or having to let somebody else experience the, the sadness of rejection? Um, I would say the rejection is probably worse. Do I have to reject somebody? Okay. Grail, you have any thoughts on this notion of requited and unrequited love? Well, rejection yeah, is I've temporary, had, had right? Had well, possibly, Unify. Let's let's go down the line. Uh, and we'll, I'll, I'll try after after each person, I'll try to leave it open for comments from other people that open that thing up next. So let's, let's go ahead with uh, Grail. Go ahead. Yeah, I've, I've had those where I, I liked somebody. But then I don't really always recognize if somebody likes me anyway, so it doesn't really matter to me <laughs> most of the time. You're an INTP. So have right. have others uh, expressed to you, oh, I think you're cute, Grail, but then you don't really want anything to do with them? No, I was just like, oh, thanks. I think you're all right, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, I know, or, you know, sometimes I'd be in a mood where I just want to you know, show off and be like, I know I'm cute, so what, 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 what's the big deal, you know? Tell me something I don't know, you know, <laughs> joking around. Yeah, I never take these things Because I don't think, I don't think these are a big deal, and then, and then they get really hurt, or they'll be like, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant, and I'm just like, oh, oh, crap. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it's like Zachary said the other night on a video, he's like, people are random. And then, as I mentioned on a video earlier today, I hate to repeat myself, but I'm going to anyway. Um, and I thought to myself, well, sort of, it depends. And then the INFJ is like, hmm, not really. You can pretty well predict. Yeah, people aren't random. And they are. They just kind of suck. They're not. Like, they I mean, to random. some degree, they are, but okay. they're very to me. Like, generally, they're predictable. I mean, I understand they're ruled by emotions, but they are random in the way they approach you and suddenly just do things. That's, look, it depends how the much attention you're random, paying to FE. It, it depends how much attention. If you're about walking around your head never thinking about it, then you're not going to notice things that people who are thinking about think about, you know? Right, right, right. Hammy, it's more honey? About the way which people... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say it's more about the way when, when we, it's more about the way in which people like go about dealing with those emotions than the randomness of the emotion that they have. Because like generally their actions will be the same. Like there's a pattern in the way that they react, and not necessarily what they feel. Other thoughts? That makes sense. Anybody else have thoughts yeah. before we move on to Hami? I don't know. To me, still, the, their their behavior seems really random. Yeah, I have to observe people, somebody for like months to figure it out. <laughs> people are largely motivated by the feelings, I suspect, one way or the other. Yeah. Either directly by their own feelings or indirectly by 
their own feelings about other people's feelings. Hami? Yeah, I, I've always been on the other uh, other side of it. So, you've I've been the rejector to, uh, or like the reject rejected? People. Have you been the rejector rejected. or the rejected? I'm sorry, say again? Rejected. Oh, okay. Rejected. That's uh, challenging. Because um, every, because every girl that I've been with is um usually like obs not I wouldn't say obsessed, but they're usually the ones that approach me. I see. So and if I do approach them, yeah, I usually make sure. I usually make sure that um, like I I usually can tell and I know where's a mutual attraction. Okay. Um, I would say about knowing that that thing you just said is something that I'm bad at. I I can't really tell, and I would be happier if they would just tell me directly. If we get all, if we just talk about everything openly, like you know, uh, what what are you thinking? But see, most people will say the truth. The truth. The answer is. Either they know how they feel about you clearly right now, or they're trying to figure out how they feel about you. And when you try to get them to give you an answer about the sort of things, it's not very productive, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> other thoughts? N A N D E? We're on to oh, you. Um, generally. I don't know, sometimes I can tell when people like me, but sometimes I can't, like I'm completely oblivious, and that kind of sucks. <laughs> um, well, not for me, but um, I guess the people that I've liked before, it was, just, it was unrequited, but like, I think most of them were censors. One was an INTJ, but you're an, I you're an that. INFJ, right? Yeah. Okay, so your dual would be. Do you know what your dual ESTP. is? Say again. ESTP. ESTP. Have you? Do you think you know any such ESPs, or do you have? Have you ever had any such individual in your romantic scopes? I was thinking about it. I don't think so. Like, I'm thinking maybe, like, one or two of them could have been, but I think most of them are, like, well, actually, <laughs> now that I think about it, they probably were yes. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, I definitely relate to the, like, I'm sometimes I, I'm completely oblivious to whether, like, when someone likes me. Yeah. I would think, Nandi, you would be like more really clear awful. about that. I would expect you to be feel more certain about that stuff. Well, see, the thing is, like, I can tell when other people like other people, but like when it comes to me, I'm not so sure. Like sometimes, generally, I can tell when I'm like paying attention to it, and they're like in a closer friendship with me. I guess, like, they're they're in my like line of sight, so to speak. Whereas, like, the other people aren't necessarily people that I really pay attention to. So I don't really look at their actions. It's interesting. I note people's mechanisms of motivation or mechanisms of ach achieving what they want to do. So if somebody comes up and I'm meeting them and, and they're kind of a, uh, a hustler, I usually tell right away and will behave slightly differently accordingly. I, I don't feel any uncertainty about it really and it seems really obvious to me. I can, I can read other people's maneuverings, you know, but I have a very poor understanding of how other people feel about me for sure. And I think that the fact that you indicate that you're not quite sure 
is an interesting point as well because I made the distinction before recently about the difference between spatial intelligence and and something like playing video games or like playing uh, I don't know tennis or something like that uh, is that spatial intelligence is about two objects not you how they relate to each other and so FE in that regard is about how other people relate to each other other individual how an individual relates to another individual not you as it's mm. as it's one of its limiting factors right it seems to me it, it must be the case now if the higher it is up in the stack I think the better idea you're gonna have about how people feel about you because if, if it's like if it's in the dominant stack like Abraham he understands how people feel in the moment and as a whole in general and I probably but see I don't know because like he couldn't tell if this girl liked him or not and he kept asking me advice about it and, and saying like he, he, he's he thinks he's playing around with them like being coy being coquettish or whatever but he's not really sure and so maybe I, maybe even with it in the dominant slot you're not really sure how other people feel about you you probably have a much clearer understanding of that if you have FI I would guess mm, I don't know I don't somehow I don't think so but I suppose I wouldn't know other thoughts like before after the fact, I don't know they did I'm sorry, I can usually again. tell if somebody. Sorry, what? Oh no, you can talk. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, I was just saying that even I could generally tell if somebody likes somebody, you know, in my group or my friends or whatever. Yeah. But I can never tell with me. Yeah, the only way I can usually tell is because um, I I've studied like body language, so that's how I usually tell. It's a very practical way to approach it, you know, like, I'm not going to rely on my gut instincts about this shit. I don't get it. I'm able to acknowledge to myself I'm not particularly naturally skilled at it, and I'm going to actually learn some shit. ENTJs do the same thing, right? Like, Kunkel has this odd, n almost natural-seeming social thing. And somebody like Chad, K Chad Crandall... He's got it down really well, you know. He's pretty. He's pretty natural seeming, you know, and that's that's the thing about the NTJs, is to non I, to non NTJs. It's like um, it feels like they're all angles, you know, like there's no soft round edges to them, that they uh, present in a way that's that's not nuanced by tone stuff in the way that non-NTJs generally attain some of, at least. Plebeian? And like the sad thing is like... Oh, go ahead, um, homie. Go ahead. No, I need to wait I'm a little actually, bit longer. I'm working on that. I'm trying to get the timing <laughs> of that right. You know, where I wait the right amount of time and not too long? It's tricky. I'm thinking about it actively. Go ahead, homie. I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, and the sad thing is that uh, I've actually lost a couple of friends, like because of that, because um they usually they like me, and then I'm like completely surprised, and then like I completely like reject them. Yeah, well, you know, people don't enjoy being rejected. Uh, as somebody who's been rejected. Plenty, uh, and somebody who's dealt with it in the past poorly, and who's dealt with it in the more recent past, I think quite well. Then I can tell you it's better to deal with it well than poorly. Uh, and now let's move on to Plebeian Eric, whose comment prompted the topic of conversation. This topic of unrequited love. Have you anything to say about it, Plebeian Eric? I 
I think. Oh, I can't. Oh shit! This thing again. I always forget the chat doesn't automatically go down. Let's see. Nope, all your comments were great. Your FE is getting stronger, Eric. Thank you, Plebeian Eric. I appreciate that. I'm working on it. All right, uh, T-shirts, you are up and up to bat, up at the plate. All right. Um, is it still about the unrequit or whatever love? Yeah. So eat both directions. Either okay. It's basically loving somebody. And yeah, you love somebody, somebody and they don't like you back. back. Or the other way around, somebody liking you and you don't like them back. I found it easier for me to be content in my in my emotional status with other people to be in a situation where I'm loving somebody and not being loved back. Because as soon as I, somebody loves me, I have I have, pro, I have a priority to take into account <laughs> that individual's needs, their feelings, and all that stuff. They are in my hands. Their emotional stability is now in my hands. There is a structure at which, and there are things that I have to do, and there, my autonomy is being tested. I do not like that, generally. I like being able to just say, here's everything I have, all that I have, and I have the opportunity to just leave whenever I want to, and I won't hurt your feelings. That sounds great. That's generally how I've been like, you know, where it's just, okay, so I can love somebody, and I don't have to worry about hurting anybody's feelings if I stop loving them. Great, I'll, I'll take that. Because generally, I'm so I'm I'm very um uh I'm not sure. I'm not, I, I I become emotionally involved with people very quickly, very quickly, and and then it's uh, and then I realize oh my god, this person is not compatible with me at all. What the fuck? I'm out of here. That's generally what happens. You, you mean you close the distance instantly, and then you're like, okay, wait, hold on, hold instantly. on there, T-shirts, hold on, I'm, I'm rushing, I'm rushing headlong down this mountain. I better look around and see what kind of mountain it is. Um, let's. I want to ask. Uh, I wanted to mention this: that there are different kinds of circumstances in which one has to deal with something in this general domain. One of them being uh, divorce, in which one party wishes to remain married and the other party wants a divorce and that was oh. at least sort of technically my situation where I wanted to remain married or at least didn't really see the point in a divorce or understand why it was necessary um, and I still really on some level don't understand why we got divorced but it it's fine I mean the thing is at the same time so, so when something like that happens you've got multiple things at play on the one hand... Wait, is your ex-wife an a ESFJ? Yeah. No wonder she wanted a divorce. As soon as she stopped liking you, she had. she's like, what do people do when they stop liking somebody? They get a divorce. That is what I have to do now. <laughs> no, that's what she did. Uh, Why would I guess you get married I... in the first place? What's that? Why would you get married in the first place? I mean, it was a good marriage for a long time. It wasn't a bad marriage. We were close, yeah, right? Yeah, no, I'm monogamy. Is the commitment enough, though, without the papers? Oh, well, I mean, sure. We were together for like seven or eight years before we got married. The, the marriage papers were... Jesus. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's something Candace wanted to do. She wanted to She wanted to have a wedding, basically. She wanted to have a wedding. That's what happened. That's, that's Oh, my God, I hate weddings. I hate them. I, I hate them, too. I, 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 I like weddings. my wedding. I like my wedding. But I hate when people are like, I hate it when girls or anything are like, let's go to see a movie. Because that's what people do. That's what couples do. They see movies. We're, like, let's have a beautiful marriage. Because people love, love wasting money on marriage. I'm like, why the fuck do you want to waste money on a marriage? I, I, I mean, we had this exact fight. I, I was like, we don't need to waste money on a wedding ceremony. It's a ridiculous waste of money. It's useless. But it, it does no good. They want to have it. That's their whole shtick. That's their whole thing. Yeah. <sighs> it's fun. It's a waste of money, is what it is. Like, why? We can do that in the basement. We don't even have to spit anybody. Why do we have to all have all this materialistic thing? I think it's worth it. At least the backyard. If you love wedding. her enough, then you'd be willing to put up with that. Like, obviously, Eric did. The, the only reason, the only reason I would have a marriage is if it, if it, if it made my significant other happy. There's not a bone. There's not 
anything in my in my being that would make me want to waste so much money on some kind of superficial marriage to validate my relationship with somebody. And that's exactly the point. You just said that. You go through with it if you liked her enough. Believe me and Eric. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Unified. No, I don't got nothing. I mean, a, a month in the marriage, and after that, I just want to put my head in the oven. Just let it cook. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think. handle marriage, man. It's not. It's not. I mean, the commitment is fine, but papers. I mean, that's like it's like putting a chain around your ball. That's all it is. It's called prenup. <laughs> all right. Well, Unify, there are t there are two different there are two different issues there, which I want to get to in a second. But I wanted to comment briefly on Plebe and Eric's comment about the SFJ who didn't realize that would mean she would have to be independent now. Uh, that's quite exactly what happened with my ex-wife as well. Um, when we had a conversation in which I was saying to her, well look, Candace, you need to explain, first of all, we need to come to this decision about how we're talking about this. You're acting as though you're entitled to money from me, as though you have a just claim upon money from me as spousal support or something, or just to take care of you, even though you're leaving and I'm advocating that we stay together. So my position on that is pretty straightforward. It's explain to me the justification for your claim. And she wouldn't do it. She couldn't do it. She had nothing to say about it, really, except then she would, she said, but you know, she wanted her cake and eat it too. You know, that's that's the thing. She wanted her cake and eat it too. She wanted to be able to have the divorce go the way she wanted to, with it scheduled the way she wanted it scheduled, and her packing on the weekend that she wanted to pack on, and all that kind of stuff. And then she wanted she wanted all of her autonomy, but then she still wanted me to feel as though we were a family, and I needed to take care of her. And I was, how could you do this to your family? As though those things aren't. Are, there's no contradiction there you know it's like well I feel as though when it comes to my being taken care of we're still family and I feel as though when it comes to me living here and being wife and stuff that we're not still family so that's why those two things exist concurrently and the fact that they're mutually exclusive and can't exist concurrently because either you know I I'm not buying part of a cow right I either get the whole cow or none of the cow. And that's something that some the TI four slot people like her who also has um, NI in the seventh slot, right? ESFJ has NI in the seventh slot, TI in the fourth slot. They are very susceptible to latching on to truths that are unrelated to anything associated with consistency, TI, or truth, NI. <laughs> That poses a bit of a problem for him. <laughs> it's so <not> true. <laughs> Alright, what was that last part again? I just said ESFJs, they have a serious problem when it comes to anything related to TI in the fourth slot, their consistency. So if it has to do, it has to be consistent at all, they have a problem with it. And it has anything to do with truth, because NI is in the seventh slot, they have a problem with it. So if anything that requires them to be consistent or know the truth, they're gonna. It's gonna cause them difficulties, and they have a tendency to latch on to truths that are unrelated to reality. That's why romance novels sell. We are the, this is our, the culture of relationships is just built upon what you are supposed to do. What you're supposed to get married? Oh, you don't love her anymore. You're supposed to get a divorce. You're supposed to go do this, do this. Like no, no. Why do well, you should this? get a divorce. You should get a divorce if you're if if you're not benefiting each other. And while Candace may have been wrong in consistency and wrong on the truth of any of the words she was saying, the outcome was correct. I'm much happier without being minded all the time. I don't want to be minded. Is marriage and monogamy inherent? Is it possible to have like a marriage with like multiple people, like in the same, like you married to four different people at once? Is that legal? It's not no. legal. Is it healthy? Is a much more interesting question. Is that illegal? Polygamy is illegal. It's illegal. Uh, 
setting aside the issue of whether it should or should not be le illegal, it is illegal, but should or should not, let's set that as issue aside. Do you think that there's any cause for someone to say, that's bad, not because, I'm not saying we should force people or whatever, but that's bad because it's not a healthy relationship. Do you think there's good enough cause to make that claim, or do you think that's just being judgmental? Can you repeat that? Can you Lauren, I, don't, that I, I will repeat it real quick. Uh, so the question is, I forget. All right, Lauren distracted me with this question. <laughs> I don't know. I forgot what I said. Now you can't hear me. You, you said um, you said whether uh, that having being in a polygamy, uh, apart from it being illegal, could you consider that healthy? Or if you if somebody were to say that that's unhealthy, are you saying that that's judgmental or something like that? Right. Is it just being judgmental, or do you have legitimate cause to say this is a a, a argument? Just as it's not ever healthy to be bulimic, you can't say, well, oh, this is just a lifestyle choice. This is my way of losing weight. Um, that people agree in general that it's okay to pathologize that, to say that's a disorder. So, um, oh, okay, Lauren. So, would it be fair to my third partner if I love my second partner more is a good question. Um, uh, you know the Mormons... Yeah. Yeah, but I don't totally. think it's legal marriage, though. Uh, it's it's like semi legal in Utah. <laughs> Wait, is there even a reason why polygamy is wrong? Where, where, what is the what is the consensus? That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to ask. It it obviously shouldn't be illegal because the reason it shouldn't be illegal is because people can still have multiple people. They act as though they're they are their wives, they can have spiritual marriages, quote unquote, which is basically saying, I'm married to this chick, but I'm sleeping with all these chicks too. And, but the thing is, why would that be, if, if in fact legalizing marriage in a formal manner of law is desirable, why would it be less desirable to have a bunch of legal wives than to have one legal wife and a bunch of illegal wives? Here's a problem. Or, or, Our not culture not really assumes, that, assumes that it's normal it is normal and it's right for somebody to be monogamous and to be heterosexual when that isn't the fucking case. People aren't naturally monogamous and they're not naturally heterosexual. Let's separate those two things. Hold on there, Trenton. Those are not the same thing. I'm talking about marriage in general. I'm talking about marriage, <laughs> legal marriage. Okay, well, let's talk about monogamy. Let's keep the topic narrow so that we can come to something more definitive about it. I've heard that Just, monogamy is kind of a more like, recent of it. Okay, so there's, he says monogamy is more recent. Is there anybody who wants to try to defend the notion that monogamy is a is a, is a healthy state of, of a relationship and non-monogamous relationships are less healthy? Um, yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, I, I'm on that side as well. I, or at least I'm going to argue that side right now. So, okay, I think, I think go ahead. Marriage, oh, sorry. I think the marriage... Uh, with two two people, I don't know, I don't care what gender it is, but two people really trusting and being both sexually, you know, mentally, whatever, open to each other and making a, a life that's like a very uh, an idealized and um, optimal way of living. Because at the same time, you have to consider, you have to put into the fact of the human emotion in any equation. In in two people marriage. You two are the only ones in the factor, in, in the relationship. You two are at the same level. You enter whether another man, another woman, there will be competition, which will be fun and exciting, I'm sure, but not a good idea for raising children and having a stable relationship that you, you can last till, I don't know, you die or whatever, or divorce. I, I have a question. I have several questions. Why, why would it be inherently competitive? And why would it be wrong for raising kids? And like, why why are all these like none of the negative things you've stated are, are like being supported? Okay. Right, I'm not. I didn't really support anything uh, that that I agree with. Um, as I believe there was a. I don't know. It's not like I go around and studying about monogamy or anything. But also, part of it. There's a study. Fifty percent of monogamous it. relationships end in divorce. I can tell you that. Okay. No, look, actually, that's not that, the fucking point. That statistic is wrong. Uh, there's a couple of... Go ahead. How is this statistic wrong? 
So basically, what what that study did was, let's say there was a hundred person, like there was a hundred couple getting married in year X, and then in year year X plus one, fifty couples divorced, and therefore they assumed the fifty percent ended up in divorce. When in reality, it's just people that had been married longer getting divorced. It's not. From the previous, it's not it's not the hundred couples getting divorced from the previous year. You know, there, there, it, was, it wasn't them. It was just a combination of people from previous marriages in years before that had you know gotten married, like that had gotten divorced, and that that's how they derived that statistic. I have a question, Grail. Do you think humans are naturally monogamous? Naturally, I'm yes. not sure. I'm not sure. Eric, why? Eric. Okay, well, first of all, the issue of divorce rate to me is irrelevant because we're not talking about whether or not people have healthy monogamous relationships. We're talking about whether or not there are healthy forms of polygamous relationships. And I would argue that no, there are not for a couple of reasons. One, let's just start with a cognitive function approach. People are dealing with different prioritized values that in an ideal relationship match up well with each other to allow those two individuals to both communicate, provide differentiation within the relationship, and support each other's respective weaknesses. That works in pairs. It doesn't work in threes. It might work in fours. You could form a quadrable marriage, maybe. Now that, that, that would be worth it. That'd be interesting to try, a quadrable marriage. But then you might as well just have two couples who hang out together all the time, right? So, but the thing is, again, remember, I'm not talking about what the law should be. I'm just saying about whether or not it's healthy for an individual to do it. So the second reason, and the more pressing reason why I don't think it can be healthy to have a polygamous relationship in general, there may be exceptions, is that sexual jealousy is, in fact, a natural phenomenon, and it's deeply ingrained in most mammals and bird species as well. Uh, the fact is, we have reflexive issues of feelings that are beyond our conscious control, and beyond the issues of being a so-called, quote-unquote, civilized person removed from nature. We understand possessiveness over mates through a biological imperative that's driven by our, our feeling of ownership over that which the reproductive offspring. So there's a third reason I'm going to tell you, which is when you're in a marriage, you're in a partnership, when you're in any kind of partnership, there's an intimacy between partners that's not possible when a third person is present. It changes the dynamic of things. So a polygamous marriage is really, usually, as far as I can tell, I don't know, I don't, I've never been in one, but I don't think it involves this one lucky dude sitting amongst his, his multiple naked wives altogether. I think it involves him sleeping with one, and then the next, and then the next, and the next. At least that's what it looked like on the Mormon show that my wife used to watch about the polygamous guy. Anyway, the point is um, that level of intimacy requires trust, and it requires a trust that's predicated on exclusivity, that there are truths exclusive to the two of you, there are secrets that you share with each other that you don't share with anybody else. If you have multiple intimate relationships comprising a compound marriage of sorts, that's not possible. Sexual jealousy also being natural means that there are going to be, it's going to be a, a feelings minefield for you. There's going to be a lot of parties with hurt feelings in various contexts over various things. And you say, does it have to be competitive? Blah, 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 blah. Well, no, I'm not saying it's not possible to construct a scenario in which there is an exception. I'm just saying it's very unlikely to make you happier than a single person monogamous relationship with the right other person. And you know, in law, there is an exception for you know this kind of passionate killing, and that that is to count for that jealousy factor in human beings. Uh, like you, you, come home, you come home and see your wife with a man, and you kill that man in that heat of the moment. Yeah, it is actually called heat of the moment. But if you do that, you know you're not going to be necessarily charged for murder. It's going to be an exception. Because they lesser, understand you are just so angry. It's, it's not considered murder, then. It's considered like a kind of manslaughter. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, and most it, states do allow that. There's well, a reason for that. It's because humans are that possessive. Oh, another thing. All right, well, in that scenario, 
those two people have also signed a contract saying that they will only be spit. They only love each other. Period. They both love me. And one more thing, on that. if all right, let's say in the logic about people naturally being sexually possessive or whatever, and they're in a, a polygamous relationship, and you know, I'm I'm jealous. My my second significant other is having sex with my third significant other uh, more than me. I'm jealous. All right, now that's a problem, and it warrants that uh, polygamy can be problematic. All right, would you agree that it's that it's not inherent in every human's nature to love one individual at one time? Like you take a person in a marriage, is it possible for that person in that marriage to love more than one person? Yes, I think it's possible, but that doesn't mean they should get married. Do you think? But all right, well, hold on. Let me, wait, wait, wait. Let's, let's look not... at that question more carefully, okay? Is it possible for them to love another person? Do you mean is it possible for them to say words that mean that that are I'm in love with somebody else, Barbara. I've got some bad news for you. I'm in love with somebody else. Is that is that what you mean by is it possible to love another person, or do you mean is it possible for them to have no. sex with another person? I mean, let's say you have let's say on a on a percentage scale, you have a certain percentage of love you can give out. That's if you give out, you can give fifty percent to one person. You can give fifty percent to the other. You don't think that's possible? I don't think you're. I think you're predicating on a false assumption that that love operates as a finite quantity of thing that you dispense. Well, I was saying, for example, I don't think it. I don't think it actually operates on that. Right. Level, well, but. but I mean that's the thing because your but your but your conclusions are based on that mechanism. And the reality is, love, as far as I can tell, is a behavior that you you engage in to um, to satisfy an urge to care for another or to. Um, to satisfy an urge to uh, uh, protect another, or I, I'm not exactly sure, but it's not it's not the thing. I get where you're coming from. It should be like that. It should really be like that, but it's not like that. So you don't think you're capable of like loving, right? In your example, what you have, what you've defined as love, you don't think that's you could feel that way towards multiple people. Well, what I indicated was that a true partnership is predicated on a level of trust and intimacy, right? You're sharing stuff with this one individual that you aren't sharing with other people. So, in my opinion, that you can't have a polygamous relationship without sacrificing that level of partnership intimacy. And that ultimately, given the nature of human beings and their need for a sense of stability in their emotional lives, such that... Uh, it, at least from my perspective, as an ENTP, I know I need a relationship to provide me emotional stability. I need to know that person's going to be there, that she's not going to threaten to leave me every time I fuck up a little bit, you know, that she's not going to, uh, you know, sleep around. I need to know that shit. That's all, that's all I need to know for sure. And then everything else can work itself out. I know she's going to be fussy sometimes. I'll probably forget some or whatever. Blah, 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 blah. The point is, as long as I know she's solid, I don't got to really worry about it that much. She's got to deal with occasional maintenance tasks. But that's the thing. I need that from a relationship. I'm saying, is it possible that it might be healthy for other people who don't need that at all? I don't think so. But possible, like, predatory people, maybe, who just want to, like, predatory dudes, like douchebags, who just, like, I'm going to score as many chicks as I can and, uh, and seem to not be capable of reflection at all. Then maybe they could actually be happy like that. I don't know. I'm sure Genghis Khan wasn't complaining as he was impregnating half the continent. <laughs> but it, it, exactly. But the, the the point is that you're not having a healthy marriage. I think that's the big point. Is that in a right. poly, you poly healthy for Genghis Khan? Cannot. I mean, he could have, yeah, he gave, like, he made, he made sure, like, half the women he ever, you know, did, like, all gave birth, but those women weren't being necessarily taken care of. Right. Just because he's happy with the marriage, happy. just because he's a fucking douchebag and is happy just saying, like, well, I don't care about her. I, I mean, I, as long as I am having sex with all these women, impregnating them, and causing them to, to breed out my genes for all eternity then I'm satisfied. It doesn't matter if they're happy in a relationship. So, no, I don't think it's possible to have that healthy, be it, uh, the female in that and call it a healthy relationship. So, you know, even if you are a complete douchebag and it seems healthy for you, you it has to be healthy for both people. Let's set that criterion right now. It can't just be healthy for Wait, one part. Do you, think, do you think it should be yeah, restricted I don't think, then? I think you can love. No, I don't. 
I don't think government should have anything to do with marriage at all. There shouldn't be any legal yeah. marriage. It should just be the church that you're with, if you want to do that, or you just say, I now I'm married, or whatever. You don't need any laws about marriage. It's ridiculous. Common law marriage? <laughs> yeah, common law marriage is fine. That's a good solution. Well, eventually you get legally married. I mean, I understand why there are some some reasons why you want legal attachment because you say, look, when you engage in a marriage, you're engaging in not just a emotional partnership, you're engaging in fundamentally a business partnership as well. Because, I, uh, shockingly to me, this isn't necessarily the case, I guess, anymore. But because I know a lot of people who apparently have separate bank accounts, like the wife and the husband have separate bank accounts, and sometimes the wife will run out of money and be like, "Honey, I'm broke," and the husband will be like. Well, that's your problem or something. I, I mean, I, it's inconceivable to me. It's inconceivable. But apparently some people do that. But I never did. We always had one bank. You know, we had more than one bank account, but we always shared everything. So it's natural that if there's a falling out, there's going to be some issue of property division. So there's reason why somebody might have a legal status that affords them rights to some of the property versus a legal status that does not afford them said rights. I have a question for you. I have a hypothetical for Eric. What's Eric? Alright. Here's a hypothetical. Let's say you're still married to your ex wife. Alright. The marriage is still existent. That, whatever. Alright. You, you're doing your coaching job. And there's this new ISFJ assistant coach female. Right? And you just fall in love with her. What do you do? You're still in love with your wife as well. Oh. Well, I mean... That more or less happened, except it wasn't an I, ISFJ. It was an, I, it, it was an INTP. Um, but what happened was, I didn't touch her. And then later, I was accused of having an emotional affair. Because I talked to her about how my crazy wife was probably going to leave me. And, you know... Candidate didn't like that, and yada yada yada. The thing is, I never did. I didn't touch her. I didn't touch her. And in fact, I I didn't pursue that, and I tried to preserve my marriage. For and, and the feelings were, I think, it's fair to say, reciprocated. But I didn't pursue that. I and I tried to preserve my marriage best I could. And by the time I got out of that marriage, because the wife, the wife wasn't having it, um, that ship had sailed. You know. All right. Here. Here we go. Did you like the INTP for a different reason than you liked your ESFJ wife? ESFJ well, I mean, the weird thing is, the thing that was bringing the INTP and I closer together was the same thing that was driving the ESFJ wife away, which was my conflict at work. And my ESFJ wife was citing against me consistently and insisting I must be crazy, that there's no way that I wasn't to blame for my difficulties at work. There's no way that my employer was really this shady and stuff like that. But she was. I wasn't wrong or lying. And the only person who was right there with me was my assistant coach, Kimball. And Kimball is a freakishly perfect match for me in every regard, in every sense of the word. It's like, this is, this is a dangerous situation, I thought at one point when I started to realize, oh, I'm not completely detached from this situation like I thought I was. Um, she's the same age as me. She competed in policy debate in high school the same year as I competed. She went to states the year I qualified for states, but I didn't go. She was state champion in California. She's very tall, much taller than, uh, almost, not, not quite as tall as me, but like maybe up to my chin or something. Um, I'm 6'4". And, and we're both you know, we're both debate coach, we're both policy debaters, we're, we're, we, we connected on so many levels, so deeply. Plus, she's recent, fairly recently divorced, has two small children, and I was looking, you know, I was thinking, well, I want to get married again because I want to get another kid, I want another kid. These kids were already three or five years old or whatever. It's fucking perfect, it's just made to be. It's made to be. But, here we go. It, it didn't That's happen. That. It didn't happen. <laughs> Alright, here we go. Let's just say, well, you're on the INTP. Um, I, I, would say, I would say that you you connected with the INTP on a totally different level than you connected with your ESFJ wife. The ESFJ wife was a, a caretaker, your home, quote unquote. It was just, 
I need you to make sure that I have not just, I have not forgotten to eat, I'm not dead, I'm not starving somewhere, I have not become obsessed with some intellectual pursuit and exhaust myself to the point I've died or something, you know? Your ESFJ is great for that. Your INTP friend would have traveled with you down the road of starvation ch chasing a intellectual pursuit. Do you think you could have had a relationship with both of them, with both of them supporting two totally different parts no, of yourself? No, because what I did is I, is Campbell started to become my caretaker, is what happened. Jesus. I, I needed to Ow. have that. I needed to have somebody to, to handle shit, right? She, I was working with her. We were in a partner in, a, in the debate business together. It didn't end up happening for a variety of reasons, mostly having to do with timing. And uh, and so, I mean, the thing is, I I started to rely on her to make uh, business appointments to handle my shit like that, you know. And she she was she was riding right alongside with me for a long time there. It, I mean. It was weird because it should have been obvious to both of us what was going on, right? Like that we had fallen in love with each other. Because this, a woman doesn't um, spend all of her free time with her boss at work uh, because she's so into what you guys are doing, right? Which is fighting, fighting the work battle first, and then after the work. She was the only confidant I had. I mean, even talking to her on the phone back and forth, because I couldn't even say a word about it to Candace without her freaking out at me. And you know, it's like I, my wife was pushing me away as hard as she could, and Campbell was right there in the trenches with me, waiting for me to turn to her, and I did. And I, but I never touched her. I mean, I never touched her. Like I didn't hug her and shit. I shook her hand. So. I have two oh. questions. I have two two questions. <laughs> two questions. One. All right. Your let's just say. I forgot. I was gonna say Christ. Okay. The um. What's her name? What her name? The INTP. Nandi. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, uh, Grail. No, 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 no. You're you're the. Oh, Kimball. Kimball. All right. Um. I would say I would absolutely have no problem with commitment. Now, it is because I build, you mentioned in one of your videos, and I completely relate to it, it is the, the TI unbreakable, once I say, once I've promised myself on so many levels, and I've promised myself that I wouldn't make loopholes to invalidate my original commitment, that I wouldn't even, it's, in, it's impossible for me to do something once I promised myself on so many levels that I would not. If you and spiked so, all I the have loopholes. No problem yeah, if you spike all the loopholes, that's how you know you're serious when you start going into your head and spiking all the loopholes. Yeah. I was, yeah. That's a, when I find I do, I'm starting to do that consciously. I really am. And here's how I, I spike loopholes. I'm like, how could this this statement I made? How is every way it could have been interpreted? And then I take those into account and I spike all the possible interpretations so I can avoid any kind of loophole action. But here, yeah. when you were um, experiencing this whatever you you had going on with what was her name again the INTP? Campbell. 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 Alright, with Campbell. Did you find yourself ever saying, is this is this you going through TI and saying, this is not going along with the system I built in my head of this uh, the, the the things I've had stocked? And then it's like no, I haven't touched her. I haven't touched her. I haven't touched her and then you remember over that constantly. Was there yeah, ever okay, a time well, when look, you kind first of made all, it with Was that Rod? This is what happened. First of all, I was doing the same thing, the same process of like fighting these battles of work and doing the work stuff together, starting like forming a business, stuff like that with her. And I didn't notice at all that there was an issue, potentially, uh, until one day we were driving in the car, we're driving in her car. She was driving, which is very unusual. I'm almost always driving in every situation. That is just that you're fucked. When an ENTP is just a passenger in a car, when a, like a girl's driving, that is just that is the ultimate caregiver. Just completely relaxed. That if I was in that position, I don't know. Well, I, I hate I hate riding in other people's cars. I almost always want to drive, but for some reason, I guess on that occasion, I was just okay with it. I don't know why exactly, but the point is, in this van ride, we had a big throwdown in the middle of the drive about something like 
how, like a, like a case strategy or something. You know, like, no, why would we want to run that crap? Ah, we're yelling at each other in the car. And then we reach a, a spot where I go, like, well, how about we do this? And she goes, well, okay, but if we do that, too, then we're linking to that. Oh, yeah, you're right. That's a good idea. Okay, cool. And then we then we paused for a second, and then we both laughed because we just had this, like, oh, you know, man. five minutes. Oh, fuck. That's what's five good. That's five minute, like an NTP. Five-minute NTP bonding storm, right, where we both yeah, fought oh, it out man. full blast, and neither of us had a... And we both enjoyed it, and we both felt like, hooray, right? And then after that, I had this weird feeling. I was in the van, and I felt this rush of warmth through me. And I realized, I'm in love with Kemble. Oh, shit. It was months All after. Sl- it had probably been there for months. I didn't know. All right, and you were still married. Yeah, but I didn't. But, but then at that point, that's when I thought to myself, okay, well... I'm not, not, atta- I'm not attacking you, Eric. You don't no, have to I know, I know, I know you're not. I know. <laughs> it, it, you're, you're trying to understand what happens here if you are faced with that situation, and I'll tell you what happens is... Your situation was caused by deterministic qualities. You had no free will over this. You took into account every variable with your TI mechanism spikes. You don't have to worry about anything. Right. You didn't touch her. You got it. Right. <laughs> that, that's the gist of it. And then when I go into marriage counseling and I'm trying to defend the fact that we had conversations that that betrayed a level of intimacy in the conversation regarding just basically like, well, what do you think about this possibility if my wife leaves me or when my wife leaves me and let's talk about this directly. Because being NTPs, and she said to me, she's like, I've never had an honest, direct conversation about romance like this. And uh, I'm like, well, I mean, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't we? So the thing is, um, that that was called into question in my marriage counseling session. I was trying to preserve my marriage, and I said, "Well, look, I I understand that I crossed some sort of a line there, and it was unacceptable, given that we were still together and not not divorced. But at the same time, you need to understand, I knew going into that situation because Candace kept harping on the fact that that somehow I was being careless." Spending that much time with a woman, being that close to another woman in general, that I was setting myself up for making a mistake. And my my point was twofold. One, I, I had nobody. You you turned away from me, Corey turned away from me. Everybody thought I was crazy, you know, and except for Kimball. And number two, I went into that knowing I had everything spiked out very carefully in my head. There was no way I was gonna touch this woman. I didn't know that there was there was any possible reason why one would have to worry about spiking one's emotions in this regard, you know? It's like I don't spike them because I I barely believe in them, you know? I have to, I've had to come to believe in them. You know, I, for a long time I just sort of didn't think I felt them ever. I didn't remember feeling them. I was unlikely to be like, "Oh, I remember the other day I felt sad." I never remember that. It would just be like did I? I don't know. How do you even know that? I don't know. But now I understand much more clearly what they are and everything. But um, the point is, at the time, I didn't see any reason why... I, I spiked out everything that I knew to spike out. So that that happened to me was um, unforeseeable on my part, or at least unforeseen. And regardless, I fulfilled my formal duty not to touch somebody. And it has to be... That has to be your only formal duty, ultimately. Because... You can't say exactly where the line is between an acceptable amount of emotional closeness with somebody and a non-acceptable amount of emotional closeness with somebody. There's no clear line there, so it can't be a clear duty to uh, uphold. Uh, although I agree to the extent that some some extreme version of it, it obviously is out of line, then in that regard, I can see that on some level I was out of line at least somewhat. It wasn't really in your control though. Well, I mean, I could have not had those conversations with her. That's the thing. I couldn't, maybe I couldn't control my feelings, but I could determine not to float that idea. Here's the beautiful thing about feelings, right? They have no concrete value or anything, so you can validate your position as the victim, or you can validate your position as the bad guy if you want to. If you want to say, I'm the victim, everybody fucked me over, I started to hang out with the Kimball. You can be the victim. Your position's valid now. 
officially because you say so. <laughs> that's a beautiful thing about subjective experience. Well, I mean, that's why I'm trying to divorce it from subjective experience. I'm saying I, I don't want to simply excuse myself. I want to determine where exactly I was at fault. And to the extent that I was, I believe that's where it was. I should not have floated a conversation that was in violation of the spirit of, of a marriage. However, I, the thing is, it, I, I, while I acknowledge that, Candace always wanted to make that out to be a much more significant issue than her spewing hate at me for months at a time, right? I mean, I would often find myself saying, you totally hate me, don't you? And then she'd always say, no, I love you. But That's so funny. My eyes have hate. She hated She tell me she hated my guts all the time. She yeah. just tell me she hated me. Because we, we were just like, the, like, everything we did, it was just like the, it was the exact, like, our motivations for things were so opposite. The only time we did well, this is interesting, the only time we did well is when the other person was unhealthy. So she looked at me and she was like, she's like, been doing dumb shit, she's been catastrophizing things, going through any, she come to me, she's fucking happy as hell, she's with a dominant any person, we're working great. Or if I'm going through unhealthy SI search, I go hang out with her, and she has dominant SI, I'm like, great, I'm like, <laughs> you know, but at our both healthy, content places of our personality, we just had conflict constantly. Because you're too, you're too young, you're too extreme versions of yourself. So as you get older, you probably fit better with an ISFJ because I think young ENTPs are, especially like you and me, are uh, we're a real fucking handful. Uh, Plebe and Eric, I want to talk about something you say right there, which is uh, about where was it? Oh, sleeping in separate rooms. My wife and I slept in separate rooms usually. Uh, neither of us liked sleeping in the same bed, but. One of us would go to the couch in the living room. We didn't have separate rooms. We just slept in separate rooms. We usually wow. start the start the night maybe together in bed for a little while, and then one of us would move because it's uncomfortable. Nothing wrong with that. Did most of your arguments with your ex wife start with her asking to do something or saying we need to do something, and you replying with why? No, most of our arguments started with. I mean. At the end, there were so many argument triggers, it's hard to even category, catalog them. But, I mean, ultimately, they boiled down to, um, I've got an idea. And Candace oh, saying, okay. oh, no, you do not, young man, because <laughs> we can't have that. Oh, that's funny. That's so true. Oh, my God. That's so great. Well, it's just the funniest video. I watched that video of you going to her house or something, and like going. And I just remember you looking at a door or something. And I remember laughing so hard because you just get fucking with the door. And she was just like followed you around, monitored you, You're like. This is so <laughs> right. Oh I mean, God. the thing is, uh, that thing about how much you trust your partner is critical as well. That when you have a, when you have a. Uh, partnership in which you really trust the other person I suspect that things play out very differently than when neither party really trusts the other and neither Candace or I really trusted each other I, Candace didn't trust me because I was drunk I didn't trust Candace because I couldn't I couldn't convince her of anything using the same tools I used to convince everybody of things she had zero faith in my NETI combination to be correct, God, yeah. if it if it ran afoul of her FE conclusions, and it caused us constant problems. Yeah, that's the that's the first problems that me and my senior brother, I didn't realize at the time, but when I was like in the, like I guess like a, a sophomore junior or whatever, and we she would I never understood why I felt this way, but she would be like, you know what, um, uh, Trent, we should go see a movie because that's what couples do, and I'd be thinking, why? Why? Why don't we just go sit at home and let me tell you about all these awesome ideas I have? Why don't we just not go and do some... See, she gave you the wrong this? reason. Is this the problem? Is non-thinking types don't understand that usually when they have conflict with thinking types, it's for one simple reason. They've not given us the true reason for whatever it is they want. They've, they've tried exactly. To, they've she tried did, to she tell didn't just go, hey, I want to validate our relationship status and go see a movie. And instead, she said, I want to go see a movie. Right. I want to spend time with you. I want to see this movie. I want to spend time with you seeing this movie. It's going to make me happy. That's the actual reason. 
the reason when the, when when feelers give us reasons other than the actual reason like that, then we note that that reason doesn't make any sense. Question. We were like, well, that doesn't make any sense, and then we challenge it, and then you get in a fight, right? If feelers would just say the truth, it makes us look like assholes because it's like I just asked you to see a movie. Right. <laughs> But you told me the reason you wanted to see the movie is because you were curious about French film, and I said, "But you've already you yesterday you told me you hated French film, and and blah, blah, blah. you know, don't don't tell me don't make some reason up in the first place. We won't have this fucking problem." Yeah, and then another thing is if I another it, it takes well, if I had to say if I was to have a little bit of objective self criticism is when I would assume why she would want to do something. Or something. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Oh, I'm sorry. The reason I didn't didn't do with what what you wanted to do was because I assumed that you wanted me to do it for this reason, and I came up with this other reason why so that, this other thing that meets that criterion, which you didn't provide me. Like, yeah, I totally get it. Uh, all right, let's end this video here on unrequited love. We, I hope your love is not unrequited. Uh, if it is requited, fuck you, I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> something like that, I don't know. Thanks for watching Talk with Fans, people.